laboratory safety practice. Because it's an area that um, I always find that people are actually interested in, and you can relate to some of the things you've seen at your facility. Always makes it a lot more interesting, too. And um, we'll talk about electricity, talk about mechanical problems. And if you've actually seen this happen at your facility for some reason, uh, I would appreciate you making contributions. For instance, if you take a look at the laboratory, or even in the environment, you have five major types of hazard. Electrical shock, electrical burns, there's a big difference between the two, fire and explosion, heat buildup, and mechanical hazards. Or uh, chemical hazards, too. Well, that could be, yes. I should add that, I guess, shouldn't I? Yeah. Absolutely. I guess that's even more prevalent today than in the past. Of course, what they've done a lot of times in the <coughs> facilities is to be able to have chemicals near you at your bench or your work desk. You actually have to get a special permit and all kinds of stuff, believe it or not. So the way HP did it in the sales office areas is they just restricted them from happening. So if you look at electrical shock, how many of you have been shocked? The three supposedly Does admitted. Did count with those little pens that were purposely made to shock you? No. no. <laughs> and um, it's like when you're a little kid sticking a butter knife in the outlet. Yeah. Oh yeah, I never did one of those. I knew better. I wonder. I wonder I what it is about recently. kids. That's the question. Asked. We didn't have to worry about that as much as we do today. Now, um, have you ever been electrically shocked where you actually see your skeleton? It happened to me one time, and it was really kind of bad. Uh, I was in a dark house, kind of like in the closet. Couldn't figure out why the red light wouldn't go on for photography. And I stuck my finger around. I shouldn't have done that. And I ended up going directly into the uh, socket. And that hit me so hard. And I was younger. I was about 14, maybe, 13, 14. And it hit so hard, and luckily... What happened is that I shocked me. I dropped it, but I had a headache that aged for a week, literally after that. So it was really pretty severe. And that if I'd done that now, it would have killed me. No question about it. So electrical shock can be very, very dangerous. I've seen two people actually die because of it. One was a guy who was working in his attic in Southern California with an electric drill. This is before battery-powered electric drills. And up in his attic was about 120 degrees. And he was perspiring like mad, drilling some stuff. And, of course, perspiration, zero resistance, and all that kind of stuff caused it to connect with the hot. and went down through his arm, right through his heart, specifically. And they couldn't get to him fast enough, effectively. One person had the same thing happen to them using a drill on the ground underneath the trailer. So it does happen. Anybody see someone that really had electrical shock working with electrical equipment? Uh, there's cases too that if you'll notice something, which we'll cover better, there's a little device you can use to check and see if your wiring in your house is correct. Now, electrical burns is a little bit different. What happens when you get a burn is you get a little arc. A little arc is like a lightning pulse and it damages tissue. When that happens, you need to go to the hospital immediately and get it taken care of because the damaged tissue has to be cut out. It will not heal. It cuts it out, and they bring it back together in that. I suspect there's quite a few people that have done this and not realized that the burn causes that to be damaged. That can happen with cars and batteries, can it? You've seen it. You've probably drop something across terminals or maybe a lot of you are playing games and let's put this crescent wrench across the terminals. That kind of thing. You're, you're smiling, Kristen. That might have happened to somebody at our job. <laughs> job. We dropped up a car on a battery pack. Yeah. That, a dark flash. That's going to actually happen more and more now, isn't it? Burn. 
Because back when you um, had, before you had sealed batteries, you had to check that every time you open it up, open up the top, look down and see if there's water, put distilled water in. You do that on electric golf carts still. They're not sealed. They're actually like the old fashioned, they're typically six volt batteries. And then there's the fire and explosion. That can happen intentionally or non intentionally. What amazed me at Union 76, they allowed smoking in the refinery. You could go out in a little little shed like they had and you could smoke out there. You couldn't smoke anywhere else. But then the, uh, they had like three or four areas there. They had wastewater treatment, they had electrical generation station, they had gasoline purification, and then they had the cracking, and they had wastewater treatment. And they had all systems running these and worked pretty well. And of course, you've got heat buildup. Heat buildup is a sneaky one. Because like humans, we're very tactical. We like to touch stuff, literally. And you go up to a motor and you say, hey, is that motor really working? What's your first thing you do? Touch it. It doesn't glow hot, but man, it can burn your hand very severely. I was asking my son once, I says, is that compressor working okay? And he just reached up between the pipe that goes between the compressor and the tank. It wasn't, it, the uh, insulation had broken down and fallen off. And he got himself a fourth degree burn practically, just by touching that. And that's, so you gotta be very careful. And that causes actually from the air going into a, low, a high resistance area, creating the heat itself. So you know of anything else that's heat buildup? On that? What about mechanical hazards? Anybody here ever had a problem with mechanical hazard? That can be pretty dangerous. How many of you have ever worked in a wood shop? In school, high school, college. And are you familiar with uh, a thing called a jointer? You're not familiar with the joiner, Martin? I'm nervous. A joiner basically planes the wood edges, typically. But the one they typically have in the high school labs is about six inches wide. And it's a very, very dangerous thing if you don't pay attention. In fact, the thing to do is always pay attention on that. You just can slip and your finger go cut off, that kind of thing. And they've got planers that plane the flat side of the board, specifically on that. And then they also have doweling jigs, doweling. A drill, it's actually not a vertical drill, it's a horizontal drill. Where it drills in the side of your boards and where you can do pegging and things like that. But what happens is, is that uh, they try to say, you, know, you wouldn't wear any long sleeve shirts, ties, any kind of thing that drains off your neck or whatever, or long hair. And this one girl in the class, she just ignored the long hair she reached down like that, wrapped around her uh, the shaft on that drill, and it ripped out a chunk out of the skull like this. Not hair, a chunk out of the skull, basically, you know, as far as scalping. So you've got to be very, very careful. Just think about what possibly can happen on that. So mechanical hazards can be pretty dangerous. Are there any mechanical hazards in the area you work, Martin? Yeah, tons. What are some of the ones you have to pay attention to? Uh, the shaker itself, because the shaker, the, the shaker goes up and down. That's correct. I had a case where an electrical shock, where a guy was repairing the amplifier on the shaker, he got on the back, and he was playing around with the wires. He wasn't didn't turn it off, and you're talking about thousands of volts. Now, voltage isn't really what's the problem. Turns out, with electrical shock, it's actually current. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And it slammed them up against the wall with such force that it actually brought them back to life. Because it had it, frozen everything up, and they say that's exactly what happened. Another mechanical hazard is when you're working on something with a ladder. You know, and you um, have your wedding. By the way, the, one of the worst mechanical hazards is your wedding ring. Why is that? Because you could pick up a box, you could literally pick up a box. And toss it, and it could grab that wedding ring and rip your finger off or shred it practically. That's happened to people that have told me on ladders. They'll slip off the ladder and they'll grab, and it'll cause an injury to their hand. 
that even happened to one of the nighttime TV stars, didn't it? Remember? Can't remember his name, but that was basically the last three years, four years. I've seen so that happen <laughs> twice in the Navy. You did uh, have twice in the Navy. That ring just ripping people's just the skin right off. More common than uh, well, it's just pretty common, unfortunately. It's so common. Actually, I never uh, wore a wedding ring after a certain point because it was too dangerous, especially plowing around in equipment and everything else. But it's the mechanical movement. And by the way, there's not a comfortable recovery either on that. Thank you for your contribution, Brian, on that. Now let's take a look. Now HP used to have a medical division, and they built a lot of sophisticated monitoring equipment. And this is the effects of 60 hertz electric shock on the human body. And notice here the current intensity, in fact, the one second contact. And so what happens here is you can actually perceive a milliamp. You can feel it. A lot of times what the electricians will do is they'll touch their fingers like this, and the current will flow through the thumb and the finger, but you can never be sure. And that because a lot of people will touch them like this, and that current flows to the heart directly. So you've got to be careful with that. Now notice five milliampers accepted as maximum armless current intensity. How much comes out of your wall outlet? Typically it's what? 15 amps. Now if you have one of the plugs that you actually have the plugs like this, and there's a little bar across it, you know, perpendicular, that's a 20 amp capacity. So a lot of current can flow through there. Then if you look at 10 to 20 milliampers, that's the let go current before sustained muscular contraction. That's still less than an amp, isn't it? That means you can't let go of it. Now this is the only time you can take that guy you don't like and clap him across the head with a two by four. You know, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So remember that back in your days there. You know the NASCAR system where they have their not NASCAR, but they have their racing electric cars. And I saw read an article where that's part of their plan. Anybody that's working on it, there they have another guy behind them with a really big stick. <laughs> Move so them away from it, right? I'm trying to work that into our plan. <laughs> Oh, and that's to make sure that we have a big stick and that I get to control it. Now what's, uh, what is this big stick usually made of? Wood or fiberglass. Wood. Not good now what happens with humidity in wood? It starts to essentially get the moisture. And that's one of the things that happened with the initial linemen, that everything was fine until it was rain or very humid. Then the stick became a conductor. So you have to be worried about that somewhat. Now, if you get to 50 milliampers, it pain, possible fainting, exhaustion, mechanical injury, these functions actually happen. Now, the one thing about this is that um, that's probably what I hit when I did this thing in there, because that's kind of how I felt, pain, possible fainting, exhaustion. Like I said, it was a Pretty tired for a week afterwards, and headaches and that kind of thing. Notice that 100 and 300 milliamps in that range, ventricular fibrillation will start, but the respiratory center will continue. Now what happens is ventricular fibrillation is when the node gets out of whack. It starts not being in sequence to give you the right heartbeat. That continues. Of course, they talk about actually doing the compression and that. That, that the percentage is actually fairly low that that really helps. These portable devices, as far as shocking you, work pretty well. And a lot of companies have them very close by. They even include them in buses now. And of course, six, six amps is sustained myocardial uh, contraction followed by normal heart rhythm and temporary respiratory apollo. But we still can go to 15 or 20, can't we? So that presents an interesting problem. I'd like you to turn your book on this uh, slide, and we'll point out something to you. Uh, 
uh, let's see where it is. Down at the bottom of the actual diagram that you see here, see where it says electric shock, most common. Um, Martin, would you read that first little paragraph? I'm where you are. I'm on the book where this chart is. 8-2. 8 8-2. Electrical shock is the most common and serious hazard. Is that the one that you're on? Yes. The amount of current forced through a human conducting path will determine the lethal aspect of the shock. 100 volts can be as deadly as 1,000 volts. It's actual current flow, not the actual voltage itself. A lot of people think it's voltage. Have you ever, any of you have ever used a TENS unit for muscle repair or, or therapy, anything like that? It's, it's called a TENS unit. Yep. And, uh, and the battery they use in there is 9 volts. But man, you can really get your muscles really contracting with the current that it generates. You're pointing to something? Well, we were just talking about that yesterday when we were out walking around the Yeah. Because I've had three shoulder surgeries. I have, a, I have my own tension. Yeah, and that keeps the muscles active, doesn't it? They don't atrophy, and that's what you use. Or if you're in the back, sometimes the back muscles get deteriorated or hip muscles get deteriorated in a TENS unit is very helpful. But that's only a 9 volt battery. So you're down in the millivolt, uh, milliamp region that's working there. Now the next one here is kind of interesting. Uh, could you, Vernon, read the next sentence? Next paragraph? Yeah, the next paragraph. There, uh, there, is, there is also a relationship between the frequency of the applied current and the minimum current required for Fibrillation. Guess what? The maximum human susceptibility is near 60 hertz. At higher frequencies, the current changes faster than the heart can respond. Kind of interesting to note that. In fact, uh, have you ever watched um, when they do launches of rockets and they have the strip chart recorders? They, they implement them on a computer screen now. This is where you had a strip chart with like eight channels of a needle plotting on that. And what they would do during a launch is that the human eye and brain can interpret these charts very, very quickly, better than the computer system can. And so they'd look at this, say, we're going to have a problem on this nozzle before it happens so they can compensate for it. They still do that in the testing, but the strip chart is on the computer because the guy is walking to do. And what happens in a true strip chart recorder, they typically have a 200 hertz response. So as you increase the frequency, the, the distance it does, so it'll go t -t 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 down to maybe 200 hertz, and then it's a straight line. Okay? That, that kind of thing is what we're talking about with response to that statement about the heart can't respond. Now, we have power frequency here at 60 hertz. You probably have that in your lab, but what do you have on airplanes? 400 hertz. Now, there's a good reason for that. And the way you can view it is this. I mentioned to you about that when you have a lot of uh, generators in that, getting things going that fast, things can rip apart. But that's not the reason an aircraft. Take a look at a 60 hertz transformer they have down at the dam. I don't know if any of you are planning on visiting the dam while you're here. Paul? Or as Hoover Dam? Maybe. It's really kind of interesting to see. Go down in the internals and walk around too. And what happened there is that uh, they're big. But if you take that big transformer and put it next to a 400 transformer of about this way, about that size, what's the difference in weight? Big time, isn't it? So the main reason they use 400 hertz is because the components weigh less. less you know, as far as load, greater distance, that kind of thing. That's the reason they do it on that. Actually, it was on the next slide. Okay. Um, you can always read these specific things here. I do want to bring one down here. Uh, soldering irons can cause fires. Today, a lot of them are more instant, aren't they? Push them and they're battery powered. and They can actually take and really get hot fast, but you need to worry about burns, then you can solder something. Are you still soldering? Yeah, definitely. Hooking up transducers, right? Things of that. 
and making some repairs on the older equipment. Absolutely. Now in the Cal Lab that I worked in at uh, General Dynamics, they had two sides. They had a high frequency side and a low frequency side. The low frequency side, we are all working. There was only six people on, on night shift or second shift. Majority of everybody was on first shift. And I happened to be there and I said, I smell something burning. But I also was the only non-smoker in the lab. So my nose can pick it up a little better. And I said, no, there's nothing burning. So there is. And so I went back into the high frequency side on the other side and the soldering iron had been pushed up against a cardboard box. It was plugged in. So that could have kept on fire. Now, I'm going to kind of say somebody probably did that on purpose. But I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't. The problem with that is, is that, um, heck, the fire service would turn on, but all of that equipment in there is basically on, powered on. So you would have destroyed several million dollars worth of equipment. And the facility. Yes. It would turn on the water, probably the whole facility would have been flooded. So you've got to worry about that. So you've got to really worry about something that may cause a fire. And we talked about loose clothing, didn't we? Loose clothing is a bad thing around machinery. And of course, at this time, you have one set of eyes. So you should always use some sort of safety goggles when you're working with things. In the near future, I would guess probably in the next within the next 10 years, I suspect we'll be able to have eye transplants. Because we've already been able to interface the optic nerve, haven't we? Couldn't do that before. But you can actually do that now. So, and then and that. Of course, we may have to relearn, relearn how to use the new eye. But then again, I suspect that when we are able to accelerate growth, that uh, genetic growing of parts out of our own body, from our own tissue, will be possible within 20 years. You know, it's hard to believe that, but hey, there's nothing hardly impossible now. Okay. How about grounds? You know, ground is one of those things that's very difficult. To illustrate what grounding can, can or can't mean, there's this one guy that wanted to take and take his daughter to, um, what is it, um, daughter, son, day where they go, go to business. You have that available at your place? On that. Same idea. This one guy was going to take his daughter to work and set her up with some special straps for ESD. And, and uh, she said, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm grounding you. And she starts crying. She says, well, what did I do wrong? That kind of thing. There must be 10,000 different meanings of grounds. And that's part of the problem. And so what happens here is you have the earth itself right here. Now this vehicle, as you see here, is actually isolated from Earth, isn't it? In this case. What you've got is you've got the uh, rubber or the tires isolating the vehicle from the actual Earth. Now some people, what they'll do is they'll drag a chain, won't they? Why do they drag the chain? Probably discharge the truck or car or whatever it might be. This right here shows you a chassis, the actual chassis is connected to the case where when you plug that third wire in, this grounds the whole thing. Or this electric drill, this by the way is a Tim Allen drill, you know what I mean, from Home Improvement. Yeah, the one that's this big. <laughs> On that, well as it turns out there, the case is metal, and so that green wire is connected to the metal case just in place the back black leads cuts off and touches. That's a safety issue. Again, a lot of the drills are now using batteries, aren't they? On that. And of course, a flashlight has its own uh, common path, grounding system, if you want to call it. Ground really should be used a symbol for Earth. And that symbol for Earth is this one right here. See this one right here on this slide? That's the symbol for Earth ground but it's used all over the place. So you can't really assume that it's actually connected to Earth. Even a wire that's strung across the floor can be connected to the Earth via the capacitive coupling, the AC signal, can it? 
You see, that's where we get all that coupling that we were talking about. Here's a three-wire outlet, typical three-wire outlet. They're polarized. Notice that what we've got here is we've got this big lead, smaller lead, and then the actual green. The green is a safety ground. This wire connected to the smaller one is black. This one, the larger one, is white. And I always kind of wondered why, when you built electronic kits, which I built a lot of, built my own oscilloscope, general generator, vacuum tube, voltmeter, variety of different things like that, and the hot was always red. And the ground was always black. So I didn't really realize what happened, but it turns out that in the early days of electronics and everything else, we used a lot of symbology. The symbology is that what is black? Who's dressed in black? Beth. Beth, yeah. Guy with a sickle, right? Dressed in black. So anything that was black wires connected said, hey, making contact with this can cause death. So that was the symbology. That's why the wire was black on that. You'll also notice that the plugs have different sizes, so you can connect it properly in polarity. Some of the plugs in Europe are just round prongs, and they can be connected anyway. So it's not really that much of a safety issue itself. Okay, now you can go out and you can buy a little little thing called a checker. It used to be a buck, a buck and a half, and then they raised them to about six to ten. You plug it in your wall, and you can tell whether things are wired up right or wrong. And a lot of times what you'll find is they're wired wrong. And when you connect printers and computers and other things all together with it, you end up getting what they call ground loops, which create tremendous noises. So I would recommend that you go out and buy this little unit and check it. Have you checked yours? I have checked, um, I built my, when I built my new house, I went around checking to see if they had wired it or Did they? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the areas they miss a lot of the plugs when you turn the lights on and off, or like in double areas, they can be a problem. You checked yours, didn't you, in your apartment? You might do that. How about you, Eric? I didn't need to, I wired my house. Yeah, but did you check your wiring? Well, I didn't need to. I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Kristen, have you checked? How about you, Martin? No, I didn't check. Brian, have you checked? No, I haven't. That might be something you might do as a, a, a coming up homework assignment. You might be surprised. You need to have it set up. It's mainly for safety. In fact, when you look at fire insurance, who's the one that came up with all the safety requirements on electricity? Insurance companies. It's because they had to be wired a certain way to be safe. That way they give you a fire insurance contract. Because there used to be lots of fires. Now here's a case of an incorrect grounding attempt. This is going to earth, right? This is going to earth, so that's like a short to earth. Now this meter is grounded on here, and it's not floating. So if I connect this lead to B, that becomes earth shorts out this complete set of resistors. Then I connect to A. Now if I'm using a grounded meter, not a floating meter, to make this measurement, the only way I can properly do it is to connect that lead from B down to the bottom. Now I'm measuring the voltage across R1, R2 combination and A here, so I'm measuring the total voltage. Then I disconnect here with this lead down here, and I connect across B, and then I can subtract the voltages. That's what you have to worry about a non-floating instrument. So one of the things you need to find out is your instrument floating, or is it not? How about uh, this situation where we have an insulated entry in the case, but we have no ground on the case? No physical ground, and we have the hot lead coming in through a fuse. By the way, the fuse is not there to protect you. It's there to protect the instrument. And this becomes a bare wire inside here. You say, come on, that's not going to happen. 
ever park your truck or car next to a tree with a couple of squirrels in it? Ever do that? Next door neighbor across the street did. And the squirrels shoot all his wiring up in his truck. And replace the total wiring harnesses everywhere. Spark plug wires, the whole works. If you go out to Vandenberg Air Force Base, they have these sites out in the middle of nowhere, and they have rats and mice all over the place. Rabbits. And rabbits, yes. Two toss a traffic. And what they'll do is that, you know, a mouse, a regular mouse, can get through a hole that's as small as a, you can take a wood pencil, you know, that tip of the air, that's their skull. They can squeeze through any hole that small. And they love to get in and chew wiring because it makes great nesting material. Or they can even create a nest in there, specifically on that. So what would happen is the uh, Delta rockets that they would store would end up getting mice and rats inside it. And they invented it. And I said, well, what's that box there? Well, that's a rat chaser. It's a rat chaser? Yeah, we want to chase the rats away because of the damage they're doing. And it didn't work until they got a cat about this big. And it worked fine. Cat took care of it from there on. On that. So you've got to be aware of the fact that these things can get insulation off them very easily. In this case here, since this is not a grounded case and the stuff inside is not floating, if you touch this right down, it possibly kill you. 